Evacuation of children from areas vulnerable to air bombardment was an important part of the national defense scheme. In four days, starting on September the 1st, 1939, 1,300,000 were moved from the big cities and towns. From the London area alone, 1,500 special trains were run. And when the flying bomb attack was launched on southern England, another exodus took place. So evacuation continued. From bombed towns, from countries overseas, from B-bombed London, the people were taken to the comparative safety of the English countryside. In the early part of the war, just soon after the war was declared, the evacuees arrived in the village. And there were, a, I think it was a, a busload came to our, our village. And people from the village went around to take in the evacu ev evacuees. And you could choose boys or girls, and they all had a label on them. All oh, had a label around up in their neck, their name, and where they've come from. Mm. Of course, a lot of schools were evacuated. The school I was in in Ramsgate was evacuated to Stafford, and uh, I know that this, that went on all over the country, and a lot of kids were, what was the word, they were put with families in safe areas. So there's a lot of thought went into that. We had evacuees, but we had a lady and a baby first, and the first year of the war was quiet, so they went home. And then we had a lady of about 60 with her daughter, and our daughter worked on the hurricane, but because her mother was elderly, she stayed at home. So that was nice for me, because when I came home from school, there was somebody there. And when we got dried fruit on ration, she used to make bread pudding. And when I got home, would you like a nice piece of bread pudding, and that was nice for me. My mother had three. Of course, they were, there was, they were paid, you see, to take evacuees in. Not very much, but they did. The people who took in evacuees were paid by the government. And of course, they had a different outlook on life to people and children in the country. I mean, those children that came, you see, they never knew that, what a cow looked like or and milk, as far as they were concerned, came in bottles, but it didn't down there. You used to go with a can and get it from the, from the, from the farm. Yeah. That was one of the things that they, they couldn't take on board, you know, that straight away, but they got used to it after a while. And then, there was a sort of this initial rush of evacuees coming, and then a lot of them got homesick. And it was what they called the phony war. Nothing really happened to start with, you know. There was no bombing immediately in London, you know. And uh, a lot of them went home. My husband's um, family um, had two little girl evacuees. Um, I didn't know anybody else who had evacuees. But uh, of course it was, so many children um, went to stay at different places all over the country. Um, and then during a quiet time, because there was a long period at the beginning of the war when nothing much happened. And so sometimes the children went back to their parents. And of course, once the bombs started falling on London, then they, a lot of those that went home came back again, but they, of course they didn't come back to the same houses that they were in before, but that was how it worked out. Mm. My mother didn't want my brother's education interfered with. He was the one with all the family hopes pinned on him, and his school was evacuated to Slough. 
This business of breaking into our education pattern worried her. So she and this nice gentleman, whom we knew quite well, got married in 1939 in November and bought a house at Slough so that my brother's education would not be interrupted. I was at Strode's Grammar School and I went there in 1937 um, and I was there till 1942 and we shared the school with Rain's Rain's School, which was a school that was evacuated from London. So education was very much almost part-time. So, of course, we had to share the classrooms and everything. When I was 11, I went to Sir William Perkins at Chertsey, and the evacuees used the school in the afternoon so we went to school in the morning and we walked through Chertsey in single file to have our lunch at the Masonic Hall and then spent the afternoon in Percroft House near Chertsey. We just felt that, uh, I suppose, what is to be will be. We had no choice, but it did, certainly didn't help education. The senior girls had to do their final exams in the shelters. There weren't very many evacuees. I remember one uh, teacher came with some pupils and joined our school. And uh, they were made very welcome, I think. I think they rather liked being in, in the town. It's a wonderful place for children because two rivers meet in the centre of it and there are hills all around it and it's a wonderful place to play. And, of course, you very, very rarely had the sign. It was usually just for practice uh, that they uh, sounded the sign. I think we kept ourselves to ourselves more than uh, mixed, really. A sports field was turned into an allotment. So if you were naughty or if you were trying to earn points for your house, you stayed after school to work on the potato patch or something like that. So we did get chatting, but we did, weren't taught together because we were there at different times, you see. My mother worked in Slough um, as a receptionist and nurse for a dentist in Slough, and she took in two boys from my brother's school um, as evacuees. They lived with us as a family. Quite a number of the children they stayed right through the war. In fact, I knew of one lad who his parents got killed and he stayed with the lady that he was evacuated with right up until he was 17. And uh, then he went in the Navy. I became very, very friendly with one of them. Her grandmother actually lived in our town, and, and Ina and her sister came through from Edinburgh as evacuees. They stayed with the grandmother. And we met at the start of the war at Ben Hoig. She was out in Australia. She went into the WAF when I went into the Bens. When I went to senior school, we had school lunches but when the evacuees were with us, we all sat round the same dining table and you had your two ounces of butter beside you so that we didn't eat their ration of food, you see. My mother ran a small guest house, private hotel, and the majority of the guests were retired people who had uh, evacuated themselves to Weybridge from London. And um, 
Eagle Star, which I don't know whether still exists, it was a very large insurance company. They evacuated down to Walton on Thames. And we got quite a few people from them who came until they got somewhere more permanently. Of course, at one time, <coughs> they sent evacuees to places like Canada. My mother's sister was living out there, and she wanted to take me in to save me suffering during the war. But my mother wouldn't let me go. They sent supplies at Christmas and sometimes clothes for us, because clothing and food was rationed. And then, of course, unfortunately, sadly, a ship was torpedoed and hundreds of children died, didn't they? Yes. And my mother was glad that she hadn't risked sending me out. I was an only child. My brother died before I was born. My brother, who was five years younger, was going to Cardiff High School half day because so many students from London were going to the same school in the mornings. And my father decided that he wasn't getting anywhere and he'd better apply for a job. And he got into the Midland Bank and at 16 he'd be fire-watching on his own in the evenings. And um, when he was very young, an uncle in America sent a message over to say that if he went over to America, my uncle would bring him up as his own son. And he was due to go to America, but arrangements were altered in the end, and they sent bathe the babies over instead, and that was a ship which had, which had been torpedoed and the babies were lost. So time went on, so my brother didn't go to America, he just worked in the bank. Yes, I can tell you a very interesting story where, I, as I told you, I was at Strode's. I came home one lunchtime and I could hear a sound of a German aircraft. You knew a German aircraft because they were diesel engine and they went boom, boom, boom. My father and I uh, rushed outside and looked up out and there we saw a German aircraft circling in our area and the guns were firing at it, but you know, nowhere near the aircraft. And it circled for a few minutes and then flew away. Germany calling, Germany calling, Germany calling. Here are the Reichs and the ambush. Lord Haw Haw, if you've heard of Lord Haw Haw, he worked for the German propaganda people and he said that if anybody displayed a German aircraft that had been shot down they would bomb them. Time, we had a Junkers 88 bomber in our, our fire station yard for the public to see. The point being, they were trying to raise money to buy a Spitfire, which at that time was supposed to cost £5,000. That was on the Monday, and on the Friday, a stick of bombs dropped from Egham Meads right over to the Grove and they were 15 500 pound bombs. One bomb landed on the pavement outside a draper's shop called Arkell's and uh, the daughter and two of the evacuees were killed. There was a lot of things said, oh, the plane was just 
jettisoning its bombs because fighters were chasing it or the guns were getting too close. But I don't believe it because having seen what I'd seen, I think they were doing what they said they would do and that was if we were displaying a German bomber, they would bomb the area. Thank you.